III under the Roman Empire. After the consolidation of Roman political rule and after the dissemination of Christianity, the Christians found themselves with one God, a great religious concept, but without empire. The Greco-Romans found themselves with a great empire, but without a God to serve as the suitable religious concept for empire worship and spiritual unification. The Christians accepted the empire. The empire adopted Christianity. The Roman provided a unity of political rule, the Greek a unity of culture and learning, Christianity a unity of religious thought and practice. Rome overcame the tradition of nationalism by imperial universalism and for the first time in history made it possible for different races and nations, at least nominally, to accept one religion. Christianity came into favor in Rome at a time when there was great contention between the vigorous teachings of the Stoics and the salvation promises of the mystery cults. Christianity came with refreshing comfort and liberating power to a spiritually hungry people whose language had no word for unselfishness. That which gave greatest power to Christianity was the way its believers lived lives of service and even the way they died for their faith during the earlier times of drastic persecution. The teaching regarding Christ's love for children soon put an end to the widespread practice of exposing children to death when they were not wanted, particularly girl babies. The early plan of Christian worship was largely taken over from the Jewish synagogue, modified by the Mithraic ritual. Later on, much pagan pageantry was added. The backbone of the early Christian church consisted of Christianized Greek proselytes to Judaism. The second century after Christ was the best time in all the world's history for a good religion to make progress in the Western world. During the first century, Christianity had prepared itself, by struggle and compromise, to take root and rapidly spread. Christianity adopted the emperor. Later, he adopted Christianity. This was a great age for the spread of a new religion. There was religious liberty, travel was universal, and thought was untrammeled. The spiritual impetus of nominally accepting Hellenized Christianity came to Rome too late to prevent the well-started moral decline or to compensate for the already well-established and increasing racial deterioration. This new religion was a cultural necessity for imperial Rome, and it is exceedingly unfortunate that it did not become a means of spiritual salvation in a larger sense. Even a good religion could not save a great empire from the sure results of lack of individual participation in the affairs of government from overmuch paternalism, overtaxation and gross collection abuses, unbalanced trade with the Levant which drained away the gold, amusement madness, Roman standardization, the degradation of woman, slavery and race decadence, physical plagues, and a state church which became institutionalized nearly to the point of spiritual barrenness. Conditions, however, were not so bad at Alexandria. The early schools continued to hold much of Jesus' teachings free from compromise. Pantaeanus taught Clement and then went on to follow Nathaniel in proclaiming Christ in India. While some of the ideals of Jesus were sacrificed in the building of Christianity, it should in all fairness be recorded that, by the end of the second century, practically all the great minds of the Greco-Roman world had become Christian. The triumph was approaching completion. And this Roman Empire lasted sufficiently long to ensure the survival of Christianity even after the Empire collapsed. But we have often conjectured what would have happened in Rome and in the world if it had been the gospel of the kingdom which had been accepted in the place of Greek Christianity.